All right. So, uh, what are we have today? All right. Close the Chromebook. Junior, come on, man. Yeah, close them up, close them up, all the way down. Take your headphones out, headphones out, headphones out, everybody. Yeah, need to be listening. Go ahead and take them out, take them out, take them out. Nice. All right, so uh, we're starting on the rock section this week. And actually, let me come uh, back here just to show everybody. Uh, this new section is all about rocks. Um, they're doing it a little backwards from how I normally do it. I normally start off with minerals, um, and then we talk about rocks. But why not? Let's talk about rocks first, and then we'll do minerals afterwards, and uh, we'll just see how that goes. So we're going to start off with igneous rocks, then we're going to go to metamorphic, then we're going to go to sedimentary, and then we're going to talk about the rock cycle in general, um, which again is also kind of backwards. You should probably talk about the rock cycle first, and then talk about the different types of rocks that are in the rock, rock cycle. But who knows? Maybe uh, Discovery Education knows better than me, uh, so we'll just follow along with the chapters like they said to do. So uh, today we're starting off with igneous rocks. Um, before we get going on igneous rocks, anybody have any like insights maybe to the, the root of the word igneous? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's dealing with lava. So igneous rocks are dealing with lava. Um, what does the word igneous kind of, kind of sound like in a way? Ignite, yes. Um, so if you trace this word back, it goes back to Latin. Um, and it's basically referring to ignition or to fire. Um, and so igneous rocks literally by name are fire rocks, uh, rocks that are made from fire. So you have some sort of melted material. It's either going to be lava or it's going to be magma. Um, so they're going to introduce us to igneous rocks real quick for a second. Then we're going to talk about the rocks in particular. Uh, so their introduction here is about Pompeii and Vesuvius. Um, so in the year... 79 BCE. What does BCE stand for? No, not anymore. BCE. BC stands for before Christ, but we're not, we're going to try to not use that anymore. Uh, so BCE, uh, because there's a lot of, y'all may not be aware of this, there's a lot of people in this world that aren't Christians. Um, and so when you base the entire like calendar, off of right, Jesus Christ being born and dying, uh, that's that's not really okay. like, yeah, yeah. So we changed the words just a little bit. It's still the same, but we changed the words so everybody's on board now. And by the way, if you're talking about before Christ, what does that mean? Is that like before he was born? Is that like before he died? Okay, but what does AD mean? But you see, and see, you're even wrong about that because AD doesn't stand for after death. AD stands for Anno, uh, Anno Domine, Year of Our Lord, um, which doesn't have to do with this death. Uh, and so you can e instantly see why we've kind of changed it a little bit because even with the religious stuff, it's it's you're like, ah, I don't know exactly what year is after death or AD, what year is BC. Um, so BCE now stands for Before Common Era. And instead of AD, we use CE, which is common era. Um, and so this is where we kind of like consolidated the calendars. Um, this will this will be like a, a question in trivia night someday. If one day you're going to get a question in trivia night. Maybe you remember. Um, but yes, yeah, 79 BCE, um, before common era, Mount Vesuvius erupted. And we've all seen pictures of Mount Vesuvius and, and Pompeii and what happens. Um, and the nearby cities of Pompeii, and Herculaneum uh, were covered by as much as 20 feet of ash. These cities essentially just disappeared. Um, there, there wasn't anybody living like right next door that saw this happen. Uh, and so they were covered up so much that essentially uh, people forgot about them. One reason that Pompeii and Herculaneum were forgotten about for so long is that the volcanic material that buried them hardened into rock. Uh, this all, basically, this volcano wiped these two towns off the face of the earth um, and, and killed anybody nearby that, that kind of remembered that they were there. Uh, and so it was a very long time before we rediscovered these cities and their remains. And obviously, when we did, um, they don't have a picture of it here, but uh, you've all seen, I'm sure you've all seen the pictures of the, like, uh, ash-preserved people that just got, like, frozen in ash. Uh, as the volcano came down. So this is just a, a picture of what the town would have looked like 
uh, fairly simple town right at the foot of this volcano. When the volcano erupts, um, this pyroclastic cloud comes down and literally just wipes everything out. Um, everybody dies. Uh, some of the people died just like literally right in the middle of whatever they were doing that day. Huh? Uh, how long before it erupted before that time? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but this was a, a huge eruption. So you're probably talking thousands of years uh, as opposed to like a short term. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it not even supposed to erupt? Um, no, I mean, this is like BCE. So they weren't they weren't like keeping track of how long it was in between eruptions or anything. Uh but now all, all volcanoes, as long as they're active, are eventually going to erupt. Um, and so may, they probably weren't expecting it at all. Uh, and you can tell that by the city itself and how the people uh, just kind of died doing like their everyday chores and tasks. But uh, yeah, it, it was it was completely, completely destroyed the entire town and the town right next to it. Um, and so that's that's uh, a common, like well-known volcanic eruption uh in history here point mexico so uh the geology of the yosemite valley this is more related to like here us in the united states uh yosemite and yellowstone actually uh has super volcanoes underneath it um and they were formed by lots and lots and lots of igneous rocks um and so here they're talking about yosemite uh at the earth's surface igneous rocks resist erosional processes like water wind and ice. Uh, resistance to erosion allows the, allows the igneous rocks to form the backbone of many impressive features. And basically what they're saying here, igneous rock compared to sedimentary rock is much, much harder. This is like your granite um, and really hard rocks like that. And so when it comes to weathering and erosion, they don't weather and erode in the same way as the other rocks. And so you get these really nice features like half dome. Oh, my volume's on back there. Hold on. Turn the speakers on. Situated in the Sierra Nevada mountain range in central California are the largest walls of granite in the world. Yosemite Valley has become a favorite playground for rock climbers. One of the most impressive walls they try to scale is the 3,600 foot El Capitan. It's a testament to the powerful forces that once sculpted this land. As park ranger Jeff Green helps explain, it all started about 500 million years ago. Yosemite's geological story begins underwater. It's here that the process of mountain building began as sediment accumulated on the ancient seafloor over hundreds of millions of years. This sediment was subjected to great amounts of heat and pressure and ultimately became the rock which you can see in various parts of Yosemite National Park today. Although the majority of the rock, and about 95% of it, is made up of granite which is what Half Dome and the other major features of Yosemite Valley are made up of. Granite is one of the Earth's most common igneous rocks. It's a type of rock that formed here between 80 and 210 million years ago, as molten rock cooled and crystallized beneath the overlying deposits. When so the key here is, real quick, this lava never made it to the surface well i guess not lava because it didn't make it to the surface this magma didn't come out of the surface as a volcano it all cooled underground um and that's what helps it make it uh granite as opposed to any other rock and granite is going to be much much more resistant to weathering and erosion it's not going to be weathered down quite as easily the earth began to shake the entire mountain range started to rise wind and water eroded the other kinds of rock and exposed the underlying granite. Eventually, the weather cooled and the valley filled with ice. Okay, that was not the greatest video, but way um, hmm? go, ahead. go ahead. So the ground was way up there, and it just washed away. 
as big mountain deals and where the rocks? Yes. So a little bit of both. So these, what are now mountains today, were completely covered up underground. Um, the ground wasn't necessarily like thousands and thousands of feet higher than it is today. Uh, you get a little bit of both. The ground gets eroded away and the rocks get pushed up from underneath. Um, so they rise and the ground kind of sinks around them um, to, to expose them a little bit. Um, but basically, what do we use granite for? Countertops. Countertops and other like building materials, right? But specifically, why do we use granite for countertops? What kind of properties do we want besides the looks? Yeah, it looks good. There's lots of stuff that looks good. Um, what kind of properties do you want in your countertops? Yeah, because scratch resistant, it's hard. Um, so like if I'm chopping vegetables, I mean, you shouldn't chop vegetables like directly on your countertops. But if I'm chopping vegetables, if I drop a glass, if I drop a pan, um, these things are, are, if it's a softer material, they're going to crack it, they're going to break it, they're going to scratch it. And then it doesn't look as nice, which is kind of the whole point. We want it to look nice. Um, but if it's not hard, if it's not a hard scratch resistant material, um, then it's it's not going to serve its purpose. So the reason we use granite for these these projects is because of its hardness, its resistance to scratching and abrasion. Um, that's the same thing that keeps weather from wearing it down. So while we have these big hills of granite, um, they're not going to erode the same as all the sedimentary rocks around it. Um, everybody, let's keep our hands heads up. Let's no no sleeping in the back and on the side there. Brandon, wake up. Wake up, heads up. So uh, as we're going through this, think about why we use igneous rocks in the way that we do and kind of what we're looking for when we're talking about igneous rocks. The next part they talk about is the youngest Hawaiian island. Go ahead. Uh, nah, nah, you can't find a diamond that big. Uh, you could you could get like, no, no, no. All right, so uh, next we're talking about the youngest Hawaiian island. And basically, as you fast forward into the future, um, we're going to have more and more Hawaiian islands. They may not come to the surface fully, um, but the volcano that feeds the Hawaiian islands are still there. Um, this is the main island of Hawaii, and they kind of have it sectioned up by its volcanoes. Um, so Mauna Loa is the world's uh, tallest mountain and uh, I believe the biggest volcano that we have. Uh, Kilauea has basically been erupting my entire life and your entire life. I think it's been erupting uh, continuously since 1983. Um, and so these volcanoes are very much still active. Um, and the island of Hawaii technically is getting bigger every time one of these erupts um, because it's just bringing more lava to the surface. Right off the shore of Hawaii, um, is this island, uh, Loihi, I guess, uh, Loihi, and it is the youngest Hawaiian island. It will continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You'll have more volcanoes pop up around here, um, and eventually it may come up above the surface. I don't know if it's above the ocean surface or not. Uh, based on its different colors, I'm guessing maybe not right now. Um, but eventually it will come up above the surface and we'll have a new Hawaiian island. Um, probably not. That would be a lot of material. Um, but you, you will get more and more islands added on and they could even kind of connect depending on how the volcanoes, uh, progress. Uh, and so it will definitely change what Hawaii is, but it won't get big enough to be like a, a continent or even like a big, big island. Um, that's just a lot of material. Now, if you, if you took the ocean away and looked at the size of the islands themselves, um, they're pretty big, but not, not that big. Um, so now, even if it continues the way that it is or increases, probably not going to get that large. Uh, let's see. So we're done with that. Let's go to the next page. Now we're going to actually talk about the igneous rocks themselves and how we name them, uh, how we look at them, and kind of how we categorize them. So... Formation of igneous rocks. Remember, igneous rocks are formed from fire. Um, I need to have some sort of melted stuff. So I need to have need to either have magma or lava. Um, if it didn't start off as magma or if it didn't start off as lava, it's not an igneous rock. It's some sort of other type of rock. 
Um, so all igneous rocks come from something melted, either magma below the surface or lava on top of the surface. And so we have a couple different ways of classifying them. First, we classify them by what they're made out of, the composition. So what minerals are inside. In general, for this class, it's basically going to be light rocks or dark rocks. Um, if it's a lighter colored rock, like a white, a gray, um, maybe just like a mixture, that's going to be one type of composition. If it's a dark colored rock, uh, like dark green, black, uh, maybe even like a dark brown, that's going to be a different type of rock. And so the, the minerals that make up these rocks are going to be what determines the colors. Um, if I have quartz and feldspars, they're going to be light colored, pink, gray, white. Uh, if I have pyroxene, olivine, plagioclase, they're going to be your darker colors, like your, your really dark blacks, dark greens, uh, those kind of colors. So composition is one way that we separate out uh, your different type of igneous rocks. The next one is going to be texture. Uh, when I say texture, what, do, what does texture normally mean? Like if I just said, what is this rock's texture, what would you think? Yeah, the way that it feels. Uh, the feel of it is a great way to put that. And that's a, essentially, I mean, it's not exactly what it is, but essentially it is. Um, texture for igneous rocks is how big the grains are. Um, do I have really big chunks inside or really tiny chunks inside? Um, if I have really big chunks inside, it's going to feel pretty rough. Um, that being said, the small stuff isn't necessarily going to be smooth. Um, but as opposed to feel, it's more about how it looks. Can I see big chunks of stuff inside? Um, or is it mostly just look like just a rock, you know? Um, like, for instance, granite countertops. Uh, does anybody have granite countertops at home? If I don't, you're nice, nice. Uh, ooh, you're all rich and stuff, right? No, I'm just messing with you. Uh, was, and then the stock market crashed. Now we're cold. Uh, so this is a, a pretty good picture of granite. This is what most granite countertops are going to look somewhat like. Um, you can see the pieces in this, right? Like I can physically see, oh, there's a piece of something like a, a flesh tone kind of or a pink color. Uh, there's like a, a light gray or a white. Uh, I got some specks of black stuff in here. I got some gray stuff in here. I can see all the individual parts of this. I don't need a magnifying glass or a microscope or anything. I can just see it. Um, if you can see the different parts, that's a coarse texture. Everything's big. Uh, it's, it's all like its own individual crystals. If I get a different type of rock, uh, this is maybe intermediate, but I can't really see a whole bunch of individuals. It just looks like a, like a mix, like the static on a TV. Y'all even know what TV static is anymore? Okay, good. At some point, people, nobody will know what TV static is. They'll just be like, what are you talking about? What, what does that even mean? Um, and so at some day, that, that will just go away, TV static. But yes, uh, if I can see the individual parts, that's going to be large grain. If I can't see any of the individual parts and it just looks like a rock, just looks like a rock that I picked up outside, um, that's going to be fine grain. Oh, wait, I didn't need to get away from that. I needed this. Go back. So uh, that's what they mean by texture. Uh, does it have big pieces inside of it? Does it have small pieces of inside of it? And let me go ahead and say this too. Um, those pieces that you can see or cannot see, Think of rocks, especially rocks, igneous rocks that came from magma or lava. Think of these as living things. They're not living, but think of them that way. Um, if I look at a tree, the bigger the tree, the longer it took to grow, right? If it's a giant, huge tree, it didn't just start growing yesterday. Um, and that works for almost any like living thing. The tiny living things uh, usually are pretty young and haven't lived a very long life. Uh, the bigger something is, the longer it took to grow, the older it is. Um, the same thing goes with these crystals. Um, if, if these are big and I can see them with my eyes, it cooled very slowly and it took these crystals a long time to grow in a way. Um, if, if they're real small and I can't see them, then it cooled very quickly and the crystals didn't have time to grow, so they just stopped growing when they were really small and they're all very small and I can't really see them with my eyes. Um, and so think of it as a growth thing. If these are big and I can see them, 
it, they grew a lot and it took a long time for them to grow. If these are small and I can't see them, then they didn't take very long growing. They just solidified when they were young and still very small. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, that helps us identify texture. So when we go back and they're talking about um, large grains versus small grains, they're going to start to talk about how quickly the lava cools. Um, and so by knowing the grains, I can know, did it cool underground and stay there for like thousands of years and slowly cool down? Or did it come up to the surface as lava? Um, if lava comes up to the surface, how long is it going to take to cool? Like maybe a couple of days. It might be cool in hours. And not cool like it's not going to burn me, but like it's not liquid lava anymore. Um, liquid lava is not going to stay hot at the surface for like thousands of years. Um, underneath the surface, your magma can take thousands or millions of years to cool down. Uh, and so those grains get a long time to grow and they can actually get pretty big. Uh, so how do we classify these rocks? First off, we go by color. Um, and I don't know if we're going to do a lot of this. We'll see if they, they'll probably ask you some questions about this. Um, but... We have three different categories, essentially. We have felsic, which is going to be your light-colored stuff. Felsic is also called granitic. Um, and so granite countertops are generally lighter in color. Uh, they've got pinks and whites and just a little bit of speckling of black minerals. Um, that's going to be called felsic. Uh, felsic stands for uh, silica and feldspar. Felsic. Silica, feldspar. Those are your lighter color. Uh, minerals and elements. Mafic stands for magnesium and iron. These are metal rich. They're also going to be dark colored, like dark gray to black. Um, some of them a little bit of dark green, but these are going to be your darker colored rocks, mafics. Um, and then you have intermediate. If it's a mix between light and dark, you've got like that staticky with some white and some black sprinkled in there. That's going to be your intermediate rocks. Those are your general three categories. Felsic is light. Mafic is dark. Uh, intermediate is a mix of both of those. And then you do have ultra mafic, which is like super black or like dark, dark green. Um, they're very rare, though. They don't make up uh, a whole lot of, uh, of the rocks that we see in real life. So we kind of see that here. Um, Gabbro is going to be a dark colored rock. This is basalt, which is another type of dark colored rock. Uh, and then they have per peridotite, which is like a dark green color. Uh, that's maybe not the best picture here because it kind of looks like yellowy brown there. Uh, let's see what else do they have. Viscosity, textures. I kind of mentioned the textures before. Um, we do have a couple different ones. Glassy. Um, if it looks like glass, like an arrowhead, if you've ever seen a real arrowhead, it kind of looks and feels like a chunk of black glass. Um, that texture is just called glassy. Um, this is formed from volcanic rock that comes up to the surface as lava. So the lava cools super, super quick, um, and you don't have any visible grains in here. Even if you cut this down and look at it through a microscope, you only see like individual little specks. Um, there are no big uh, grains like we see in granite. Uh, vesicular, this is a weird term. When I think of vesicular, I think of the word vesicules, which is like a term for like your, your uh, blood vessels. Uh, and so vesicular has holes in it. Um, it's got a bunch of holes. Like, uh, has anybody used pumice in their bathroom? What? Pumice? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. A pumice stone, yeah. It's like a rock, like a little stone you have. You use it to, like, scrape the dead skin off your feet or, or smooth out your hands or whatever. Uh, pumice is, well, this vesicular salt, do they have? They don't have pumice on here. Uh, but, yeah, it's like this, but it's white colored. Uh all those little holes in it are what helps with the scraping. Um, and so when you get that, that's actually a volcanic rock. They just cut it out of the ground uh, and sell it to you. So uh, vesicular has holes. Glassy looks like glass. Um, and then we have large grain and fine grain for big crystals and small crystals. Yeah. Uh, it's just lava that cools at the surface. Usually it's going to cool very, very fast. Um, and so lava that's either exposed directly to the air or gets put directly into the water um, and cools like instantaneously almost. More like think of Hawaii. Like I got a volcano, the lava erupts and then literally just falls right into the ocean. 
Um, that's the kind of stuff that's going to form your your like glassy stuff like that. Let's see. Can I Yes, yeah. So, uh, because of the grain sizes, we have two different terms to describe how this rock forms. We have intrusive and extrusive. What, what do you, would you guess these terms are referring to? Inside and outside. Inside and outside. Um, so literally, was it, did it form inside as magma? Like the magma never made it to the surface. It wasn't a volcano. It just cooled under the ground. That's intrusive. You're going to have bigger grains because it cooled slower and it had time for those crystals to grow. Extrusive is going to be like a volcanic rock. So it exited the earth, went out onto the surface um, as lava, and it cooled very, very quickly. So the grains are very, very small. Did you have a question? Is it like rhyolite? Uh, what are you just saying words down there? No. What do you know rhyolite from? What do you know about rhyolite? I learned it in uh, old, old boys' class. Old boys. Oh, old boys, who's that? Old boys clothes. I don't know. I don't know who that is. Somebody here? No. Oh, uh, some someone else? Somewhere, somebody else? Yeah. 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 So rhyolite is like a light-colored volcano that uh, uh, rhyolite's the reason Oklahoma has red rocks. Uh, if anybody's ever been to Oklahoma and I seen all the red, red rocks. Huh? <laughs> no, no. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I think that's most of it. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, plutons. We only got, we only just got a little bit left. We got plutons, and then what else? Extrusive structures. All right. So plutons. Um, real quick, little Texas history lesson. Uh, has anybody ever been to Enchanted Rock? No. Okay. So if you ever get a chance, I suggest going to Enchanted Rock. Um. If you go to Enchanted Rock, it means you're driving through Texas. You're probably on your way down to Austin uh, or San Antonio or something like that. Or going to Enchanted Rock. Uh, no, nah, nobody goes just to Enchanted Rock. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe know? people do. I don't know y'all's business, but have you uh, yeah, I've been to Enchanted Rock, but I didn't go like just to go to Enchanted Rock. Just looks like a rock. Um, so this is yeah. called Enchanted Rock. This is a hill in Texas. Um, are there any people on this picture? Yeah. All right, so they must have got this on an off day or, or okay. taken it early in the morning. There's no people on this picture. Uh, this hill right here is is higher than it seems. Um, it's deceiving. Uh, when you pull up in your car, you're like, okay, I got this. No big deal. Uh, and then like about halfway up, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been to the top a couple times. Uh it's just, it's way steeper than it looks. And when you park at the bottom, you're like, oh, this is just going to be a short climb. And then like two hours later, you get to the top and you're looking down and you're like, how am I even going to like walk down this? It's so steep. Um, but this, what this is, this is a granitic pluton. Um, this, at one point in time, this area of Texas was, I think, one of the only areas of Texas that was actually above water. Um, the rest of Texas was flooded with an inland ocean, uh, and the area around en Enchanted Rock was the only place that was not. Um, but essentially what happened here, let me show you. So we get this pluton. This is what happens to magma that doesn't come out as a volcano, right? So it doesn't erupt. It comes up. You have your uh, – I'm not going to draw the whole planet, but basically you have magma that comes up to near the surface from – underneath in the mantle and it literally comes up and looks like a bubble in a lava lamp um we've all seen at least seen pictures of lava lamps um and so you have the the wax that bubbles up to the top and then it cools down and goes down to the surface we get the same kind of movement inside the earth and so this is magma that bubbles up towards the surface now the closer it gets to the surface the cooler the rocks are and so at some point in time, this magma is going to slowly cool down and just stop. It's not ever going to make it to the surface. There's not going to be any volcano where it's erupting out of. It's just going to stay right there and stop. And it, it starts to cool down. It might take a million years. It might take a hundred million years. Um, but slowly, this magma is going to cool down and solidify. And I'm going to have uh, this, this bit of igneous rock here that is not the same as the rest of the stuff around it. So at some point in time, erosion starts to happen. 
Um, the, this land is, is weathered away, it's eroded away, and it all just kind of disappears until it gets down here. The igneous rock is harder than the rest of the rock around it, and so as this erosion happens, everything else around it disappears. Like it gets taken somewhere else, downstream, out into the Gulf of Mexico, wherever it's going. Um, and what you have left is the ground level and this igneous intrusion sticking up on the top. Um, that's what enchanted rock is. Uh, it's the only hill around here for miles. Like when you climb to the top, you can see like all the way to the horizon in any direction. Um, and actually what's happened here is what gives enchanted rock its name. Um, what's weird about all this stuff up here? It's rock, but what's like, first off, have you seen like a round hill completely made of solid rock before? Yeah, no, yeah, you don't see this too often. And this layer that's kind of broken up off the top, like yeah, it looks like a piece of crust, like almost like a layer in an onion in a way. Um, and so what's happened is as this pluton has cooled, the outside layer cools first. And then the inside, and it, it cools from the outside in. And so in the pluton, you get these layers, uh, just like an onion. And what happens is this outer layer is getting eroded, it's getting weathered, uh, you know, heat and, and wind and water and rain are getting to it, but the inside layers are still protected. Um, and so that's what this outer layer here is doing. Some of it has fallen down to the bottom, been eroded away, you have big piles of rocks down here in the bottom, some of it's still here. Um, but in the daytime, the sun shines on it because you don't have no trees or no grass. The sun shining directly on it. It's heating it up. What happens to things when they get heated up? They expand. And then at nighttime, the sun goes away. It starts to cool down. The things start to contract. Um, have you ever gotten out of your car or truck? You turn it off. It's, it's done running, but you just got off the highway or something. And you start to go inside, and you can hear your car, like, tinking. That's the engine block or the exhaust or whatever happens to be doing the tinking shrinking back down because it was expanded just a little bit because of all the heat. And then after you turn the car down, all that heat starts to go away. It starts to shrink down and you can hear that little tinking. Um, that's actually what happens at Enchanted Rock. But instead of a metallic tink, you hear these big rocks on top and rocks inside uh, just slightly expanding and contracting. So you hear these like clicks at night, like, uh, it sounds like tapping coming from the rocks and weird noises that come from the rocks. Um, and so the Native Americans that lived here before the, uh, I don't know what settlers, before settlers came here, um, they would camp out at night and hear the hill making noises. Um, and so they thought that there were spirits inside or spirits that lived around there, which is why they named it Enchanted Rock, um, because at night, they're like, something's going on here. Like, there's there's something happening here inside this hill. Uh, and so that's it. It's named Enchanted Rock. So if you ever find yourself driving down to Austin, um, you're probably not going to be too far away from this thing. Uh, take a little trip off. Uh, I don't think it's too expensive. It's like a couple bucks to get in, maybe. It's like a, it's like a state park, so you got to pay just a little bit of money. Um, but you park your car down here at the bottom, and you climb up to the top, uh, and you feel triumphant when you get to the top. It's like a mini little... Texas Mountain. Um, yeah, it's pretty sweet. Is that the first layer? Like, when you know, it's all washed away? Uh, probably not. Probably not. This is probably maybe the second or third layer down. Um, and I'm sure, like, some geologist has studied this in depth uh, and kind of has an idea as to what other layers you get. Um, but these kind of plutons are actually, like, super interesting. And you can get a lot of information from them. So before the bell rings, real quick, let's finish this up. Uh, the last thing they have here is extrusive structures um do they have anything on here basically what the uh your your lava can form as it comes out they don't talk about a lot of them um well i guess the one i'm thinking of is intrusive um but anyways your lava flows out and it's going to flow downhill uh can build up in different places and you can have a lot of different things that builds up um last little local note i'll leave you with um have you all heard of the town uh called white rock no, wait, wait. It's not White Rock. It's uh, Rockwall. My bad, my bad. Rockwall. No, local town. Rockwall. Um, Rockwall is literally, this is going to sound crazy, 
It's literally named after a rock wall. Um, but it's not a wall that people built. It's, it's a natural uh, igneous rock wall that happened and people came across it. They're like, hey, there's a wall here. I guess people used to live here. Turns out it's not a wall. People didn't live there before. Uh, it's actually an igneous feature. And so what happens with this? Uh, no, nah, there's not going to be a lot of pictures of this. Um, basically, I got my ground and I have like some sort of lava underground. So I have my, my, my pluton or something down here and a crack opens up in the ground, right? Well, if there's enough pressure, this lava is going to get forced up in the crack. It's going to push the crack open and I'm going to get like this. This like crack that's filled with lava. The lava is going to cool and it's going to harden and it's going to be an igneous rock. And then at some point in time, your erosion happens. This layer gets worn away. They just keep getting worn away, worn away until it gets worn away. And I have this igneous intrusion, just like the pluton at Enchanted Rock. The igneous intrusion is sticking up and maybe some of it breaks off or gets eroded away. But I still have a good portion of it sticking above the ground. That is the, the rock, it's called a dike. This is the dike that they found uh, and named Rockwall after. And actually, if you go to the geology building at UTA in Arlington, um, they have a portion of this wall like excavated out and it's in one of the hallways of the building. Uh, and you can see it, which is the only reason I know about it because I saw it there and was like, wow, what is this? Uh, and so they have part of the rock wall that Rockwall, Texas is named after there. By the way, I'll go ahead and say this. Uh, I don't know who has plans on going to college or anything, but uh, you know, and you never know where life's gonna take you. I worked for six years after high school before I went to college, so uh, not everybody goes to college right out of high school. Uh, what you do after don't, hold on, I'll tell you. Don't sleep on UTA. Uh, UTA, you can get a degree for really cheap, and they have really good teachers there. Um, the reason nobody cares about UTA is because they don't have a what? Yeah, they don't have a football team. Um, with no football team, like half the high schoolers in Texas are like, what? I don't care. Uh, which is crazy because y'all ain't going to college to play football. At least the vast majority of you are not going to college to play football. So what does it matter if they have a football team or not? But yeah, UTA, uh, good academics and, uh, and good degree. Oh, and by the way, they do have a football team. They just don't play other colleges. They just play like in an adult league.